everyone, and welcome to today's virtual conference titled U.S.-China Trade Tumult, Implications for Global Trade Rules. My name is Casey Stelter, and I'm the Program Manager here at the Bretton Woods Committee. I would like to thank our global audience in attendance, especially all of our Bretton Woods Committee members, as well as our esteemed speakers for joining us today. This program is part of our Regional Spotlight Series. Today, we will examine key issues central to the current trade dispute between the United States and China and the wider ramifications for the World Trade Organization and multilateral trading system. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You should see the attendee interface on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. The orange arrow icon pictured here allows you to collapse and expand the control panel. By default, you have joined the presentation's audio using your computer's speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Please note that if you join via telephone, you will not have the ability to post questions during the Q&A portion. If you have a question, please type them into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the virtual conference. We will collect these and call on individuals during the Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Currently, all participants are in listen-only mode as indicated by the muted icon in the middle of your control panel. During the Q&A portion of the presentation, we will unmute individual lines so you can pose questions to the speakers. You will be prompted when your mic is unmuted. I would now like to briefly introduce our speakers. We have with us Dr. Sheng Jin Wei, the N.T. Wang Professor of Chinese Business and Economy and Professor of Finance and Economics at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business and School of International and Public Affairs. From 2014 to 2016, Dr. Wei serves at, served as the Chief Economist of the Asian Development Bank, Director General of its Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, and ADB's Chief Spokesperson on Economic Trends and Development in Asia. Prior to these positions, Dr. Wei served as Assistant Director and Chief of Trade and Investment Division at the IMF, and prior to the IMF, he was the Associate Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. We also have with us Dr. David Dollar, Senior Fellow in the John L. Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution. From 2009 to 2013, Dr. Dollar was the U.S. Treasury's Economic and Financial Emissary to China based in Beijing, facilitating the macroeconomic and financial policy dialogue between the United States and China. Prior to joining Treasury, Dr. Dollar worked 20 years for the World Bank, serving as country director for China and Mongolia. His publications focus on economic reform in China, globalization, and economic growth. Finally, Mr. Stephen Myro will be moderating our conversation today. Mr. Myro is managing partner of Beacon Policy Advisors, LLC, an independent policy research firm. Before founding Beacon in 2014, he built and managed the policy research line of business for a Washington-based strategic consulting firm for over four years. Mr. Myro has previously served as Chief of Staff to Deputy Treasury Secretary Robert, Robert Kimmett, as well as Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff, and acted as the CFO at the Export-Import Bank of the United States. Thank you very much to our speakers for joining us today. And Stephen, I'll now turn it over to you to tell our audience a little bit more about today's discussion. Thank you so much, Casey. As Casey highlighted, today we're looking not just at the US-China trade conflict, but with a particular emphasis on the multilateral context. After all, when the world's two largest economies are heading toward a potential standoff, consequences go well beyond the bilateral relationship. I always emphasize to my clients when we're trying to analyze a complicated issue such as this, that you have to focus on the power dynamics involved and the objectives of those who hold the power. Perhaps the irony at this time is that unlike in the past, China appears to be more transparent than the United States. President Xi, for example, clearly wants resolution to the conflict, but at the same time, he also has made clear that he has certain red lines. On the other hand, President Trump appears to be a bit more opaque in exactly what he's looking for, and he's being buffeted by competing factions within his own administration, such as the so-called globalists and nationalists. So today, 
we will explore these power dynamics and how the two sides will pursue their objectives through not just their unilateral actions, but also the various multilateral fora, such as the World Trade Organization. And we'll consider what the repercussions of the trade conflict could have on uh, the current architecture of the international order. With that context laid out, let me uh, hand it over without any further ado to Shang Wen Shen, uh, sorry, Shang Jin Wei for his opening remarks. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, let me say three things as my uh, opening remarks. Number one, by the logic of President Trump, the United States has been, has been pursuing unfair trade practices in the area of service trade. That's because the United States has, has been running a large trade surplus uh, in service uh, trade against China, against most countries uh, in the world. Of course, this uh, uh, sentence does not mean really that I believe that U.S. has been pursuing unfair trade policies, but rather uh, it illustrates how uh, problematic it is to judge a country's uh, uh, quality or fairness of a trade policy based on whether it runs a surplus or not. Uh, uh, whether a country runs surplus or not ultimately is determined whether a country's overall savings uh, is in excess of or is uh, short of uh, its investment. The United States runs a very large uh, trade surplus against China and most countries in the world, probably be, uh, mostly because U.S. saving rate uh, is much lower than its total investment. Similarly, China runs by now a relatively moderate multilateral uh, 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 trade surplus because the savings exceeds in, in, uh, its uh, uh, investment. Uh, but uh, if one sticks to the idea that if you see another country running a trade surplus, it must mean that country uh, is running unfair uh, trade uh, uh, per, per policy, then we're going to be in for a, a prolonged period of, of, uh, of a trade conflicts. That's because uh, by uh, United States trade reform, uh, trade uh, tax reform of uh, uh, end of last year, uh, U.S. is projected to have a further shortage of savings on the order of about a trillion uh, U.S. dollars over the next 10 years. This will translate into many uh, increasing many bilateral trade, surplus, uh, trade deficit against other trading partners, especially against uh, uh, China. So we're going to uh, have a period of time to look forward to when U.S. is going to blame China and many other countries for problematic trade policies. Uh, 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 because of the increase uh, in U.S. bilateral uh, deficit against many uh, countries. That's one uh, uh, key point. Secondly, uh, in terms of intellectual property rights protection, uh, China uh, clearly has a you know, way to go to improve the regime uh, of intellectual property rights uh, protection. Yet in this area, uh, we see uh, promising signs. We see uh, uh, signs of hope uh, for collaboration, and that's because out of China's own development need, uh, there's increasing demand by domestic firms to strengthen intellectual property rights protection. Therefore, I see this is an area where we see uh, more uh, collaboration down the, uh, down the road. Uh, uh, finally, um, uh, some of the strategies uh, U.S. Uh, uh, is pursuing uh, uh, out, is uh, clearly outside the bound of the WTO. Uh, undermining the, the, the effectiveness of WTO. And that's actually a problem, not just for other countries, but also for the US down the road. Currently, United States uh, uh, is the largest economy in the world. I can, uh, and you know, largest in many other dimensions, most powerful nation in the world in many other dimensions can clearly flow its weight around. But being the largest economy in the world is not a permanent feature for the US. Uh, there could come a day in which US uh, cease to be the largest economy in the world, and a rule-based system will be important not just for other countries, and it will be for the U.S. Uh, future uh, as uh, well. So therefore, there's a lot at stake for U.S. and other countries to co collaborate to improve on the current international trading system uh, rather than trying to undermine it. So let me stop here. Great. Thank you, Shang Jin. And now I will turn it over to David Dollar. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, like Shan Jing, I have three points, uh, luckily a little bit different than his. I want to start by saying that I think the U.S. does have some legitimate trade concerns with China, 
which primarily deal with market access issues. At the risk of oversimplification, I would say that China still has a lot of investment restrictions. Uh, among the G20 countries, it's the most restrictive in terms of direct foreign investment. And that means there are a lot of sectors where foreign firms have to enter into joint ventures. They end up transferring their technology. And I think that's where a lot of the tension between the U.S. and China comes from. China has been gradually opening up, but it's still behind other large emerging markets. And this China 2025 policy raises questions about where China is going. I think a lot of 2025 is fine. It would be a mistake for the U.S. to really oppose China trying to become a technological power. The question is, what are the instruments that are being used? You know, there are targets for domestic content for key sectors. So I would urge China to look at WTO consistent instruments for 2025. And I think uh, U.S. does have some legitimate issues about market access. Now, having said that, my second point, I can be very brief because it's exactly the same point Shang Jing made, which I agree with. Uh, the U.S. administration makes a big issue out of the trade balance. This is not a legitimate trade policy issue. As Shan Jing said, this largely reflects savings investment balances. China's overall surplus was about 1% of GDP last year. It's actually coming down further this year. So there's not really any issue there. China has trade deficits with many countries, has a trade surplus with the United States. So economists generally do not pay much attention to bilateral trade balances. So I think that's really a red herring that's confused the situation. And then the third point I would make is that the U.S. really has launched a trade war against China. You know, first with the tariffs on steel and aluminum. That's not that important for China because the U.S. doesn't import that much. Uh, but then we've come in with about $50 billion of products that are being taxed at 25 percent. And the proposal is to do another 10 percent on $200 billion. So all of this is pretty serious. I would say some of this is a real challenge to the global system. The steel and aluminum tariffs were justified on national security grounds, but frankly, that really makes a mockery of global rules. The U.S. produces about 70% of the steel that we use. We import from Canada, Mexico, Germany, Japan, South Korea, close allies. So I don't see any national security issue there. Uh, and so that really seems to be a violation of the global system. And then this large set of tariffs China that, sorry, that the U.S. is imposing on China, that's allegedly targeting China's unfair trade practices. Uh, but China's challenging this within the WTO, I think, with good reason. And then I would emphasize that this is really going to be hurting the U.S. economy. About half of what we import from China consists of machinery and parts and components things that are used to make U.S. firms more competitive. So as we start taxing these things, we're going to be hurting U.S. firms. There will be a net job loss. You know, some people might think that protection will create jobs in the U.S. It will almost certainly lead to net job loss, and it will lead to a lot of disruption. Even if it creates jobs in some sectors, it's going to lead to significant job losses in, in many sectors. So it's really not a very smart strategy to deal with trade concerns. Unfortunately, it's hard to see any kind of off-ramp during 2018. These measures start out as rather modest in size, and they're going to escalate. Probably the effect on the U.S. economy will not be that great in 2018. As Shan Jing said, we've stimulated the U.S. economy with a large tax cut, so the overall growth will probably be acceptable this year. But this protection is throwing more and more sand into the wheels of commerce, and probably as we get into 2019, we'll see more of a downside from that. Hopefully, these two big powers will be ready to come together by then and try to negotiate uh, agreements that essentially preserve the global system, lead to China opening up more, and leading to the U.S. to stop using these, these protectionist tools. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, so I will take the prerogative of being the moderator to kick off the conversation for a bit, and we'll we'll have a dialogue among the three of us to start. 
but what I'm going to ask the audience to do is to pose your questions through the for the Q&A portion following our initial discussion. And if you have questions, you should ask them by typing them into the question box in your control panel. And uh, in a little bit, we'll come back and we'll work through uh, those questions. So to start it out, um, I, I will turn to David first, but then I, I, I kind of want to set this up as getting the U.S. perspective from David and the, and, and the Chinese perspective from Shang Jin. If we were trying to arbitrate between the two parties right now, is there a way to close the bid and the ask spread? Because on one hand, as uh, I think you both pointed out, at times President Trump seems focused on the bilateral trade deficit, even though you know, many people will say that's not what you should be focused on. And by that, the Chinese could simply, you know, at least from a face-saving perspective for Trump, you know, agree to buy billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars of things, and, and they could claim victory. However, there's also the issue the real problems we're talking about, the structural issues, market access, tech transfer. And so from that perspective, particularly the nationalists within the Trump administration, that's kind of their bugaboo. And from the Chinese side, the question is, how much of that is a red line? So let me start with you first, David, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see what Chang Jin has to say. And maybe the three of us can resolve this right here. Okay, well, so I think the serious economist answer is that the U.S. should focus on the market access issues and that it should be working together with the European Union and Japan who have similar concerns. I don't think China's that far behind the eight ball in terms of opening up and it's made various pledges. So for me, it's really a question of, of negotiating a timetable for China to remove these remaining investment restrictions. And then I think as it pursues this 2025 industrial policy, they're important to questions about what we call national treatment. If they really open up and allow 100% foreign investment in most sectors, then if China's subsidizing particular technologies, do the foreign firms in the market have access to that? That's basically what we mean by national treatment. So, so I think it's in China's interest to, I wouldn't call this sub signing up to the global norms, because I think we're talking about going a little bit beyond existing norms. So it's more a question of can the big four economies I mentioned, can they reach an agreement that it is in some way in advance on the existing WTO and that allows us then to continue to trade. Now, the political answer is more toward what you were kind of hinting at, Stephen. This unfortunate focus on the trade balance, I don't think that's going to go away. The smart move for China is to offer to buy stuff. You know, they can buy more agricultural products and energy, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not necessarily going to improve the trade balance. I think the Chinese understand this. You know, these are all, you know, if they buy more, it's going to have spillover effects of various kinds. And there are a lot of reasons to think that when we get to the end of this year and the end of next year, the U.S. is going to have a larger overall deficit and a larger bilateral deficit with China. And China buying a few tens of billions of products you know, is not going to change that. So it's probably still a smart move for China to put that in the equation. But but I think Shan Jing hinted at this is we're probably looking at a world where that imbalance that the U.S. worries about just gets worse and worse for its own domestic policy reasons. And it'll be convenient to blame China. And that's going to make it harder to address the real issues, which is what I started with in, in, in this response. All right, so Shang Jin, with, with those options out there, China has already offered to buy tens of billions of dollars of worth of more products to kind of appease the Trump administration. But every time you get close to that deal, the nationalists put together an echo chamber to make the president sound weak and say, we need to resolve these market access and structural issues. Well, David says they're not that far behind the eight ball and there's you know, perhaps you could come up with a timeline to get there. Are the Chinese actually going to make, you know, are, are they going to give in on any of these, make any concessions here, number one? And number two, are they going to do it in the face of 
what's perceived as increasing pressure and threats from the United States? Well, U.S. Uh, government appears to be asking for for uh, progress in four areas. Uh, one is market access, although the president couched it uh, in terms of re reducing bilateral uh, trade imbalance. Uh, two is uh, stronger intellectual property rights uh, protection, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, resolving. Uh, My right back, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the third. Hi, is about, I just uh, want to apologize. We're having a few technical difficulties. Uh, bear with us here. Uh, for our audience, if you're having trouble hearing, you can still access via phone call if the computer audio is not working correctly. Uh, go ahead, Jing Jin. Should, should I? Do you, do you want me to uh, start from uh, beginning? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I mean, U.S. is looking for progress in four areas. Like one is. Uh, a stronger market access to Chinese market by U.S. firms, but the president mis uh, uh, wrongly couched it in the in the form of uh, reducing U.S. bilateral deficit. Uh, two uh, is uh, um, uh, less investment restriction by the Chinese uh, side, and three is stronger intellectual property rights protection, and fourth is uh, industrial policy pursued by uh, uh, China. Uh, some of the and these four uh, demands, I think, is a mixture of something reasonable and something uh, highly uh, problematic. Uh, let me focus on uh, the, uh, the point I just want to make uh, uh, is that the way to resolve is not just that uh, China doing things on this side, because there's no end to what President uh, Trump uh, could ask for. In fact, a way to, I, I think, to think about it is that there are things that both sides can do. There are policy reforms both sides can do that will make each economy stronger, the world trading loose um, uh, uh, better. So for example, there are things that China has been asking for uh, that are uh, you know, uh, 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 not uh, without reason. For example, the Chinese side think that the US investment market is very restrictive. The US uh, uh, you know the 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 CFIUS, the Committee on U.S. Uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in U.S. The CFIUS uh, review process uh, is is highly discriminatory. So that's their perception. Now we know uh, you know uh, it, it, um, the the, the uh, uh, you know strong advantage of the U.S. legal and regulatory system uh, is supposed to be its fairness, transparency, and predictability. But these features are not shared by the U.S government review process for foreign, uh, foreign uh, investment. Uh, and, and then the Chinese side is looking for uh, reforms of that process. Uh, they can be more predictable, more transparent, that in the end, uh, potentially could be good for the US economy uh, as well. Number one. Number two, on market access. Now, we, we in the US like to think the US is very open. Of course, US on balance do have much lower trade barriers than most developing countries, uh, including uh, including uh, China, but U.S. has uh, uh, areas of improvement as well. Uh, you, you, U.S. one of the la one of the main holdout countries uh, that continues to have uh, uh, government subsidies to agriculture and to some uh, politically powerful uh, firms, and U.S. Uh, 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 anti-dumping rules are highly problematic. U.S. is one of the pioneers of the anti-dumping rules. Anti-dumping, of course, sounds like a very good uh, word. It's meant to uh, reduce anti-competitive uh, practices. But in practice, uh, you know, when, when U.S. Uh, you know, brings the anti-dumping case against the uh, uh, Chinese firm, the Chinese WTO accession concession allows U.S. to use Cost, production costs from third country, in practice, it could be Polish firms, Spanish firms, to judge the cost of Chinese uh, producers, which make it almost impossible for any Chinese producers to defend themselves successfully uh, in US uh, uh, system. And that uh, arguably uh, is uh, uh, unfair. There's, a, there's a, actually a, a clear path for reform. The clear, pa clear path for policy reform uh, is for US to lead the way to merge Domestic anti-competitive uh, regime uh, with the international anti-dumping uh, anti, uh, uh, regime, and there could be an area of reform uh, the U.S. can lead uh, within WTO uh, system. And thirdly, uh, U.S. Uh, S, uh, restrict uh, exports uh, to China and some other countries on national security uh, ground. Of course, some of the restrictions 
are, are very uh, justified, but, but the Chinese think that the restrictions uh, are interpreted uh, in the, the military uh, uh, civilian dual usage interpretation is done very broadly, uh, that becomes impediments for US firms to successfully uh, export uh, to, uh, uh, to China. So what I'm saying is there are areas of policy reforms that both sides can do uh, that uh, not only could help the other side, but is important they will be help, uh, helpful to, uh, to raise domestic efficiency uh, and, and improving domestic uh, sort of national security regime at the same time. Great. I, and I think you bring up a very important point, Cheng Jin, with regard to investment, investment restrictions. I think that there's two parts to this, right? There's the trade side and there's the investment side. And I think that um, all the talk of tariffs and the focus on that, on the trading side, kind of overshadows the investment aspect of this. And uh, particularly with the heightened uh, um, use of CFIUS on the part of the Trump administration against China. But um, at the same time, I hear a lot about how while the Chinese government wants to push back against the Trump administration on uh, you know pound for pound um, in terms of any pressure on the trading side, they at the same time want to make send a very clear signal to CEOs in the business community globally that China remains open for business and they don't want to um, discourage investment in China particularly when it comes to the Made in China 2025 um, objectives and how that they still want the technology flow that they need to come into the country. So uh, we have seen a number, not just uh, deals get blocked on the U.S. side through CFIUS um, over the course of the year, whether it was you know, lattice with semiconductors or Ant Financial um, and Genworth up until the last moment looked like it was going to get blocked until it became an existential threat for the company here in the United States as a going concern. On the Chinese side, we see um, Toshiba and memory and the, the Bain deal, but that went to the deadline. Right now, there's a lot of questions over Qualcomm and XPI what's going to happen with that. Um, but we, you know, yesterday, all the focus in the world was on the Helsinki summit, but there was a, perhaps a more important summit going on at the same time. And that was in Beijing. And that was EU and China was meeting. And what we saw there was BASF get uh, a deal approved. We saw BMW get an approval for expanded investment in the country. So let's talk about, let's take this out of the context, the bilateral context of the US-EU, particularly with respect to investment. What is China doing on the global stage with the EU? And then maybe David, um, if you have any thoughts on from the EU perspective, it seems like they're not necessarily running to China with open arms, but they're certainly considering uh, the relationship with China getting closer a lot more in light of the America First policy. So I'll, I'll start with you, Shang Jin. Oh, um, the, but there are uh, at least uh, two camps uh, uh, within China thinking about how to respond to President Trump's uh, uh, trade war. Uh, one is to uh, you know what is what they say you know uh, asking for blood in exchange for blood raising uh, tariffs, uh, which I think is a terrible uh, idea. Other countries raising tariff on your exports is, is bad for you. Raising uh, tariff on imports uh, is uh, make it even worse, right? But that's one camp. The other camp is say you know China is on a trajectory of progressively low lowering. Uh, uh, trade barriers and investment restrictions. Why not use external pressure to, uh, you know, make uh, further progress on this? But why uh, reducing uh, 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 trade barriers and investment uh, uh, barriers? Perhaps you can incorporate uh, the trade war component by temporarily holding off uh, th those reforms uh, available to American firms, American uh, 
uh, producers. I, I, I think uh, that uh, between the two, that's probably a smarter uh, approach. Uh, it, it's not always the case that people in the second camp necessarily win the argument, but in the China-EU uh, collaboration that you, you, you're referring to, uh, we know uh, one interpretation is what the, what they are doing is is uh, is this that that you know they they, they are talking about lowering further uh, trade barriers, investment barriers, welcoming more foreign investment to uh, to come in, but in the context of trade war, let's do it, uh, you know, uh, in a selective way uh, to, to signal to U.S. firms, U.S. government, uh, that uh, uh, perhaps a resolving trade war would be good for U.S. firms and U.S. consumers. Yeah, I would, I would add that, you know, I think the European, many of the European countries and the stakeholders within the countries are quite alarmed by the Trump administration's flaunting of global norms and disregard for multilateral institutions. Uh, you heard President Trump refer to the European Union as a foe uh, during his recent trip. Uh, you know, that's a pretty strong word. So I think the Europeans are definitely worried about the damage to the global system. And they're approaching China cautiously, and they certainly have issues, but you definitely see some, you know, some friendly overtures from European governments toward China. Uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense. If the U.S. is going to be withdrawing from the world, then Europe, China, that's a very important access. Uh, I think, I, I agree with Shan Jing. I think a smart move for China is to continue to open up. Trump's hostility is creating a problem now. I think you don't want to be seen as opening up with a gun to your head, but agreeing to multilateral things and letting European firms benefit from that and then perhaps discriminating a little bit against U.S. firms as the trade war between the U.S. and China plays out, that, that's frankly a smart strategy for China. So let's talk about that. If, they, if China, you know, Chang Jin talked about the two possible approaches, you know, we we'll, won't call them globalists and nationalists, but we'll take, we'll say, a lot of people say the Chinese are a lot more patient um, in, in this conflict. Uh, President Xi is present for life, so to speak, and uh, President Trump is, he's not on the ballot um, uh, officially, but his policies are coming up for a referendum in November, and then he will be on the ballot in 2020. One of my favorite sayings in the United States is, the first day after the, the midterm elections is the beginning of the presidential election. This is not an issue that President Xi has to deal with, although he clearly does have his own domestic political considerations. So let's say they take the patient approach. They play this internationalist approach. They're filling the void on the international stage left by the United States with the, since it, as it pursues the American first approach. The, the WTO, this is the regime that that we have in the current in the current international order to deal with. How sufficient is the dispute mechanism, not just in terms of effectiveness of of, of actual ability to do anything, but in terms of timing? Um, that that's in particularly for Shang Jin. Is this a question of uh, how infinite is the patience? of the Chinese, given the fact that it will take years for this to play out on the WTO side. And then after I hear from Shang Jin, I have a related question for you, David. So let me make two comments. Number one, it's important to remember that the WTO system uh, uh, is uh, set up by a set of countries led by United States with no participation from China, because when WTO rules were decided on, China was not a WTO member, and the rules were in, in fact then imposed on uh, China. China back in the early 2000s were very reluctant. There were a lot of concern uh, within the country that domestic firms will be wiped out and so on. It turns out Chinese economy adjusted uh, fast enough uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, you know, nothing uh, uh, disastrous happened. No, there was, there's been no uh, a jump uh, in uh, in unemployment rate uh, uh, in China is evidence uh, of uh, that. Now, second comment about that, that uh, 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 concrete dispute uh, cases, of course, 
uh, uh, U.S. have bought a lot of cases against China. Two WTO, uh, China has bought some cases against uh, 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 U.S. Two WTO, including the U.S. 301 and other investigations. The WTO rule post 1995 sets a 18-month limit uh, to resolving uh, any dispute brought to this, which is a major improvement to the previous uh, uh, system. How long is 18 months? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, too long, but uh, WTO's uh, any international system uh, uh, is always has its limitations. You know, in facing very large member country, if a large member country is set to not to comply with WTO rules, it's very hard for uh, international system to impose enough discipline uh, uh, on, on them. So what the system counts on is all countries, including large countries, realize that complying with the rules on balance is good for themselves, uh, not just uh, good for uh, good for uh, other countries. But what's happening now, uh, it's, in, uh, it's also useful to, to, to remind ourselves that US has been actually actively undermining WTO, not only in terms of bringing cases outside WTO, but also in blocking uh, uh, appointments or confirmation of uh, appellate body judges. Appellate body is the uh, is, is, is the mechanism within WTO to adjudicate the disputes among member uh, member countries. Uh, when uh, you know existing members term is over, new member needs to be proposed, and US has been systematically veto any new appointments in the last few uh, years and systematically reducing the number of appellate body judges. If you know, so by the end of next year, the projection goes that there will be only one member left so that any cases brought to the appellate court uh, body uh, cannot be adjudicated to 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 con conclusion that's highly problematic this is in a way ironic going back to my first comment because this is the system set up by a, of a bunch of countries led by the us and with no uh, input from uh, china yet us decided that it's that it's, it's in its own interest to and the minor system. So that's actually very sad. I mean, I, I don't think uh, uh, the, uh, the president's uh, approach is shared uh, broadly within the US uh, uh, society. So so I think uh, certainly we hope uh, at some point, someone will see the, the light and, and decided to take a different tack. All right, so um, that's a great point, Shang Jin. I actually want to reinforce that for the participants because it's a point that we ourselves at my firm were making to our clients uh, emphasizing last week, which is when you had this kind of whole uproar and discussion about is President Trump uh, looking to pull out of the WTO? Can he pull out of the WTO? Um, uh, it's clear that Congress has a say in that, but there's this what I call the atrophy approach, which is you can let an organization die on the vine by not nurturing it. And in your case, what you're pointing out is what we were flagging for our clients is this pattern of blocking the judges. So eventually next year, you could be in a situation where there just isn't enough judges. We've seen this in the United States with an organization that I worked for, the Export Import Bank that the conservatives uh, in the, you know, uh, uh, not the majority, but the minority was able to uh, create a blocking function, if you will, to prevent a quorum on the board, which limited the bank from being able to do deals of more than $10 million. And it's been that way for a number of years now. So it's kind of the canary in the coal mine, I think, for watching the risk to the WTO. You don't need to pull out from the WTO to undermine the WTO. But um, let me turn over to David for a question. And I think this will be the last question before I turn it over to Casey to uh, uh, open it up to the audience. So hopefully the other participants are typing furiously away with their questions now. Um, David, I find amazing that I've been speaking to a number of very competent people, both inside and outside the administration in recent weeks, who believe that the US is well-placed to win a tariff tit-for-tat exchange with the Chinese. They always cite you know, how much more goods, you know, 500 something billion come in from China 
versus uh, how little the U.S. Um, exports uh, into China uh, in return. However, um, what I like to point out is when President Trump, when they were doing the, the initial 301 investigation, and finally he held a meeting at the White House and he said to his team, how many tariffs? You know, I want tariffs. How much tariffs do I get? And uh, USTR Lighthizer, Bob Lighthizer, who I don't think anyone would accuse of being a shrinking violet in, in this debate, um, suggested $35 billion worth of tariffs. And President Trump said, no, that's not good enough. I like big round numbers. Let's go with 50. And when we ran the notice and comment period on that, that initial 50, 16 billion got bounced out. So uh, Lighthizer was off by about one billion because there was just too much domestic pushback on that 16 billion. So now we're running a notice and comment period on that other 16 billion. Um, I think we've seen the fact that the the tariff rate has come down from 25 percent to 10 percent on the other, and the additional 200 billion is an indication of concerns about the blowback on these tariffs. But given the, the feedback loop, I, I don't think it should, you, you had suggested that the economic feedback loop could be muted for at least through 2018, given the fiscal, fiscal stimulus and how long it takes for these to factor through. I would argue that it's not just economic feedback, but the economic adverse consequences has to actually cause a political fissure in uh, of sufficient size within the president's uh, political base for him to step up and acknowledge this. It's one thing to back off on investment restrictions and export controls, which he doesn't really ever seem to, it's hard to sell to his base. Tariffs is an easy thing to sell to his base. So what I guess I'm asking you in a long-winded way is, we have these numbers, and we have this supposed arsenal, but how much politically can he actually use before he, he himself has to cry uncle politically? Okay, good question. So I, I would first I'd point out that you know China is much less export dependent than it used to be, and especially less dependent on the U.S. You know, if you look at the value added in China's exports to the U.S., it's less than three percent of China's economy. That's a somewhat significant number, but that's a big decline from the past. So the, the notion that China is very dependent and will quickly fold, which is what the advisors said, that's, that's definitely not going to happen. Now, I would also add, though, in terms of cycles, I think the U.S. is in a better position. You know, we've already mentioned a couple of times the U.S. has this big fiscal stimulus. We're going to turn in a remarkable number for the second quarter, something like 4.5% growth, you know, which is extraordinary for an advanced economy. So in that cyclical sense, the U.S. is in a pretty good position. Meanwhile, China was already slowing because of the campaign to deleverage. Their stock market had already started to fall. Then you add in the trade war and the stock market's down more than 20% in, in China. So it's in, it's in bear market territory. But I still think that China is in a better position to take the pain. Uh, so I don't see China folding on this at all. Uh, and, and on the U.S. side, it's not that important for the U.S. economy in the immediate future. You made the interesting point that for the 200 billion follow-up, they're talking about 10%, which is a much smaller number. Chinese currency has already depreciated 7% against the dollar in the last couple of months. So in some ways, that's a wash. You know, some products will be more expensive with the tariffs, but everything else from China will be less expensive because of depreciation. Um, you know, so I, I don't think it's going to be that important for the U.S. economy, which, which may be unfortunate. And that's why I think the U.S. is likely to stick with this. But there will be some localized pain. Soybean prices are already down 20% in the United States. Uh, some of the so-called industrial heartland areas, they're going to get hit because a lot of this next round would be parts and components that American firms use. So I, I, I continue to think there'll be some political blowback at a modest level during 2018, but not enough to change the U.S. policy. But then in 2019, I think a new calculation comes in. I'm pretty sure China can take the pain. I suspect the U.S. will be looking for a way out as we get into 2019.
Fantastic, David. Um, so I could go on asking you guys questions all day, but uh, I want to stop uh, hogging uh, the mic. So um, I'll now uh, turn it open to questions from the audience. Casey, do we have any questions yet from the audience for our speakers? Uh, yes, we do. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, just a reminder to our audience that if you have a question, please type it into the question box in your control panel. And again, I just want to apologize if anyone has had any technical issues with the audio. Uh, please dial, use the dial in function if you're having any issues there. Our first question is going to be from Haiyan Wang. Uh, hi. Yes, uh, hi. You can please ask your question to the speakers now. Okay, uh, my question is uh, regarding the political ramifications. Do you think that the trade war with China will help or hurt Trump's chance of re-election? David, you want to take the first shot at that, um, and then I can weigh in, perhaps? Right, so this is very speculative. My instinct is that this will help in the Republicans' midterm election campaign, which is coming up this November, because I don't think the pain will be that great. And there'll be some groups, I mentioned the farmers will be hurt, but they seem to be sticking solidly with the Republican Party. And I think, you know, Trump said he was going to punch China in the nose, and now he's punched China in the nose. And I, I suspect that will work well with his base. And midterm elections are all about turning out the base. But if your question, if your question is specifically about his own reelection in 2020, then I feel pretty confident that this is all bad for him because it's undermining what could otherwise be a healthy U.S. economy. It's hard to predict how bad it'll get, but you hear a lot of voices on Wall Street now worrying about recession and decline in the stock market. Uh, and that would be happening over 2019 and into 2020. The fiscal stimulus will phase out. So I think this is a losing strategy for a presidential election in 2020. I I would offer a slightly different take, I think, is that um, I think President Trump, in, in, in the absence of him making clear what his objectives are, uh, I think he has three objectives when it comes to China. Um, uh, one is he wants to demonstrate to his political base that he's taken strong action where his predecessors, both Democratic and Republican, haven't. Um, so that's one, and I think he can pretty much already declare victory on that just from the optics of the perception of, of, of uh, the, the tariffs that they've already announced. Two is he has a myopic focus, as we've discussed, on the bilateral trade deficit. Um, for whatever reason it is, maybe you know Peter Navarro's convinced him that's the right measure. That's what he's focused on, and so it's kind of hard to resolve these issues unless he just accepts the offer to buy a bunch of things. The third, when it comes to China, is uh, President Obama told him the biggest issue he had uh, when he left office was North Korea. And uh, it took, I think, Trump a while to realize that China has something to say about North Korea, and it wasn't a separate bilateral relationship he was building with uh, Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un. So, I think that um, when you th those three issues are in tension with one another, so he's gonna he's kind of like a kid on a swing, and you have the the nationalists are pushing him high, and then the, when he gets too high, the globalists kind of pull him back a little bit. And with the swinging sensation, if he doesn't give in on a deal that the nationalists paint as weak, but he doesn't go too far as we saw him pull back with the investment restrictions and the export controls. I think this continues to be a winning issue with his base. Arguably, you have the econ potential economic issue that David raises for 2020. But I, I would argue that what they're talking about doing, the, 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 even though we're talking about the two largest economies in the world, we're not as interconnected with one another as we are, with as the U.S. is with several other countries. So. I would argue that the uh, threatened auto global auto tariffs and auto part tariffs are way more consequential from an economic perspective. And if he put those into effect and lets those go, 
Um, I think China, he can continue to sell to his base, but the economic fallout from that could be a bigger deal. So if he eventually pulls back on the auto ones and leaves the China ones in place, I'm not so sure that hurts him in the long run in 2020. Casey, uh, another question? Yes, thank you, speakers. Our next question is from Delisley Worrell. Uh, Delisley, you can ask your question now. Thanks. Uh, um, my question is this. Is it reasonable to expect that should China adequately adjust market access rules, the things that you say uh, are legitimate complaints, that Trump would then declare an end to the trade war? And if not, what is the way forward? All right. So let me let me twist that question one other way to Shang Jin, and then we can we can answer it as you asked it. Um, the question that Shang Jin I have is: To what extent are the Chinese willing to make concessions if they if they believe you know how much do they believe that Trump will keep moving the goalposts? Well, the Chinese uh, thought they had a deal uh, twice, actually, uh, in terms of uh, additional purchases of U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, 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 goods and services. And in their view, the U.S. had walked back on this, uh, that, that there was evidence of the U.S. being an unreliable uh, negotiator uh, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, case. Uh, uh, to the uh, question asked, I, I don't think uh, gaining more market access will satisfy uh, the uh, U.S. president. It would be good for U.S. firms and good for Chinese economy, uh, but will not be good enough uh, for the president because the president is asking to see a lower bilateral deficit vis-a-vis -vis China. But bilateral deficit, by my estimate, will increase uh, in the next few years because of the U.S. Uh, 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 tax, uh, tax reform, tax change. So it's a hopeless uh, uh, path uh, as far as satisfying the U.S. president uh, is uh, uh, is uh, uh, concerned now the uh, now the Chinese uh, effectively has realized this and what they are doing now uh, is trying to focusing on their domestic policy reforms trying to build alliances with uh, uh, many other countries uh, not always successful but they are making that uh, attempts uh, it's important to remember that not everyone uh, within China are holding the same views there are people who are pro market pro reforms there are people who are still uh, you know uh, sort of uh, uh, thinking in in the old uh, planning uh, interventionist uh, uh, way ironically the president uh, trump's uh, tactics have in a way worsened the relative position of pro market reformers because pro market reformers have been painted as being silly because they have agreed to do things the us government have asked for and that, and trying to make a pitch to their domestic audience and then find themselves being undercut explicitly by U.S. president because U.S. then go back, go back uh, on, on his uh, words in a way. So, so uh, the, the uh, unfortunate for China, I think the Chinese uh, path for greater reforms had been made a bit more difficult uh, by a U.S. A US president. So, David, um how from the u.s side what do you think it would take for trump to accept it and declare victory well, well first Stephen, i think you made an important point a few moments ago that if this seems to be a political winner uh, you know go in an ongoing way this could really drag on for years um so you know i think that's an important point uh, i still think this you know while you're right that u.s china engagement is not that enormous, it's still quite significant. So I continue to think that by 2019, you'll see more negative effect from these different protectionist moves. And you know, that. And as the fiscal stimulus dissipates, that's gonna be more worrisome. But I agree with Shan Jing that, that for the president, the market access issues are, are kind of back burner. And so China would have to come up with a package of buying things. And we all seem to agree that that's not necessarily going to change the imbalance, but it could give the president a nice headline. If there's some clear market access moves, most of which are already in the works from China's point of view, and then China agrees to some purchases. You know, a cynic would say this is the deal that's been on the table. Like Shan Jing said, the Chinese think this deal was accepted twice before, so that might make it a little bit harder to negotiate. 
But as the world changes, but you know, if there's a real slowdown in the world economy, uh, that deal may look pretty attractive. And depending on how the midterm elections go, that deal may look attractive in 2019. Yeah, the one thing I'd add is to, to kind of bridge both those answers is what I've been told uh, uh, by people who spoke with the Chinese leaders that because they feel like they've negotiated these deals a couple of times and you have the, you know, Trump uh, being buffeted, you know, as I said, the kind of the kid on the swing between the nationalists and the globalists, um, President Xi has decided that uh, uh, he can't deal with anyone but President Trump, because only Trump can speak for himself, that no one else in the administration can speak for him. And um, what I've been told is that he kind of views course as the model here. The fact that the South Koreans kind of gave up some minor changes, but allowed it to be painted as a big win for the United States. And that, that uh, you know, the the you the Trump administration declared victory on changing course and moved on to the next issue and left South Korea alone. I think the problem here is that um, in that situation, you had Lighthizer on board with those changes. But without the changes to market access and the structural changes, I don't think Lighthizer will be on board. So I think what she's looking for is for the the pain that David's talking about to go into effect and to wait until such time as that goes into effect so that Trump is willing to accept the deal that's been put on the table as a face saving way to move past this. So it just it's a question of when how long will it take for him to feel enough pain? And that's where it's a question of are the you know the Chinese willing to be patient and wait it out. Um, I think we have time for one more question, Casey, right? Yes, uh, one more question. Uh, very sorry to those who have questions, but this is going to be our final one. It is going to be from Lyric Hughes-Hale. Uh, Lyric, you can now ask your question. Oh, let me unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, great. My question is, do you see uh, some sort of devaluation that could go on as a response? I know we've had a 7% devaluation up to date, but what about something more significant given the weakness in the Chinese financial sector and also the real economy? Thank you. Steve, let me take a first shot at that and then and then Shan Jing is obviously a leading expert on this, but I, I like to point out that you know, I mentioned that the currency's depreciated about 7% against the US dollar in the last few months. That happens to be what the average currency in the world has done. So if you look at indices of the US dollar, it's, that index is up about 7% over the last few months. So China's just doing what the rest of the world is doing. It's a natural market response to US protectionism. It's one of the ironies that if the US imposes protectionism, it creates uncertainty, capital flows into the U.S., and the U.S. currency appreciates, and to a large, large extent that undoes some of the effect of the protectionism. So I think what's happened so far is largely a market result. I don't see the Chinese deliberately trying to push down the currency a lot further. You know, that could really backfire on them. If Chinese people felt there was going to be a big devaluation, then you're going to have a lot of capital flight pressure. They have capital controls, but in the emergency situation, we just don't know how effective they are. So the leaders have said they're not going to weaponize the currency. I think that's sincere, but if the dollar continues to appreciate against everyone else, it doesn't make sense for China to follow the dollar up. It makes sense for China to stick with the rest of the pack. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there's some, some further modest depreciation between Chinese currency and the U.S. dollar. Dave is uh, right. Most of the uh, IMB depreciation reflects strengthening of the U.S. dollar against all currencies in the world. Uh, there's a small part of it uh, uh, reflecting uh, uh, your deteriorating or, or moderating growth uh, in China, uh, partly due to uncertainty associated with uh, uh, trade war. Going further, why uh, it is possible, of course, uh, 
for uh, Chinese exchange rate uh, to uh, change. And, uh, as of now, it's not central Chinese central bank's uh, goal. The Chinese central bank very much uh, like to project itself being able to maintain a relatively stable value of uh, currency. However, in this context, I want to actually link to the one of the early uh, questions about how much um, uh, you know how much pain uh, the uh, trade conflict with, uh, with with China can inflict on uh, U.S. Eco economy. So, I, other than uh, currency depreciation, what else can China do? I want to disabuse the notion that just because, uh, in terms of good trade, China exports a lot more to the U.S. than U.S. than the other way around, that uh, you know uh, China quickly will run out of things it can do. That's actually a very uh, that's actually a big illusion. First of all, when U.S. imposed 25 percent tariff, there's nothing says that China can only stick to 25 percent tariff. You can go to 50 percent tariff if you, if you want to. It's not good for China, but but not something that uh, China cannot do. Number one, number two, if you look beyond goods trade, of course, I, I, as I pointed out very at the very beginning, the U.S. actually runs a very large service trade surplus against uh, uh, China. China runs a deficit. So uh, uh, you know, China can potentially incorporate the restrictions on service trade into the picture. Thirdly, if you look at uh, total amount of things American firms sell to the Chinese compared to total amount of things that Chinese firms sell to Americans, these two numbers are much more balanced. And that's because there are a lot more American firms in China selling to the Chinese then Chinese firm in the US sell to the Americans. For example, American car companies sell a lot more cars to the Chinese in Chinese market uh, than uh, trade in reverse direction. Uh, Apple sells a lot more phones to Chinese, uh, Apple phones to, to, to Chinese than US export Apple phones uh, to, uh, to China. And finally, going beyond exports, if you think about all of those things, most of those things, uh, why if it managed to hurt the uh, American a firm interest, it will also hurt Chinese consumer interests. It's not obviously a good thing for, for uh, China uh, to do. But there are actually things that potentially Chinese can think of that will hurt the US while doing very minimum damage to themselves. But uh, one area uh, is uh, rare earth uh, uh, export restriction. It, rare earth is an important ingredient to electronics and, and, and uh, making US advanced uh, equipment and potential some uh, weapons that China is now the 80% uh, exporter of, of uh, rare earth in the world, and China can potentially put a restriction on exports of those, doing very little damage to itself, while a lot of damage to U.S. Uh, uh, firm uh, interest in technology uh, sectors. Uh, and uh, uh, that, you know that so these are the things, and of course outside economics, right? Outside economics, uh, success of uh, U.S. North Korea strategy depends crucially on collaboration from China. So far, China has been doing a lot for the US and it has not received uh, as much media attention. And so far, China has not said it wanted to deviate from that. But if the US succeeds in making trade war to be truly painful to the Chinese, the non-economic uh, tools potentially can be brought in uh, into the picture by, uh, by, by China. That could come back to not just hurt the US economy, but hurt the uh, uh, you know uh, Republican Party in elections uh, as well. Let me end here. Thank you, Shengshen. So, Casey. Thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. If you still have a question that you are not able to ask, please send it to us at secretariat at brettonwoods.org, and we can relay your questions to the speakers. Uh, this concludes our regional spotlight, U.S.-China trade tumult, implications for global trade rules. Thank you again for attending, and a special thanks to our speakers, Shang Jinwei, David Dollar, and Stephen Myro for your insightful thoughts and candid dialogue. A recording of today's virtual conference will be posted on our website, brettonwoods.org, and you will also receive a follow-up email tomorrow within 24 hours that contains the link to the event recording as well. On behalf of the entire Bretton Woods Committee, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, speakers. Thank you.